This story published Friday, December 22nd and will appear in print Sunday, Dec. 240UWERKERK, -E the Netherlands, the first, and only, warning came in the pre-dawn darkness. The messenger was a local doctor, awake in the middle of the night to deliver a baby. The deck is broken, he cried, banging on the farmhouse door. It was the catastrophe that Rhea Gallic's family had feared but never expected. A North Sea storm, riding a high spring tide, had breached their defenses. As the water swamped their farm and swirled into the first floor of their house, Gellek, then six years old, her sister, father and mother, sought refuge on the second floor, then the attic, and finally on the roof. There, they huddled in the freezing wind and waited for a rescue that was a long time coming. It was Feb. 1, 1953, a seminal moment in a centuries-long battle that the inhabitants of the Netherlands have fought against water. More than 1,800 people died, and nearly 50,000 structures, houses, schools, churches, barns, were destroyed or damaged. Determined never to let it happen again, the Dutch embarked on a mammoth multi-billion dollar program to build dams, sluices, locks and storm surge barriers in the Delta region. It took 44 years to complete, and it has kept the country dry. Over the centuries, tens of thousands, perhaps hundreds of thousands, have perished in Dutch floods, not one has since 1953. And yet in flood-prone areas around the world, such as Houston, water continues to kill. 90% of natural disasters are water-related, either because of too much water or too little, and climate change will only make that worse. Houston and other areas touched by disasters work on recovery and wait for flood insurance payouts. The Dutch work on prevention. They do not offer flood insurance. The Dutch success at protecting people and property, and their determination to do so well into the future, are the reasons governments around the world turn to them after calamities such as Hurricane Harvey. People take photos of the off Sloot a 20-mile dam constructed after a flood in 1916, as it stretches off into the horizon in Dan over the Netherlands. Michael Chalo, Houston Chronicle, but it took a storm like that in 1953 to galvanize them into action. That storm starkly demonstrated how inadequate Dutch flood control policy had been. And it pointed to an abject failure by the government to honor its constitutional duty to protect its citizens from flooding. In the years after World War II, the dikes in the stricken area had been neglected, partly because a largely decentralized approach to flood risk management gave significant control to local water boards that in many instances did not have sufficient funds to maintain them. The Rijkswaterstaat, the national organization charged with managing water safety, had been warned about the vulnerability of the sea dikes in the Delta. But those who were most at risk, such as Gaelic and her family, had no idea. Nobody knew, she said recently, sitting in the coffee shop of the Water Snood Museum, the museum of the flood she helped create to keep its memory alive. Nobody knew. Sure, we thought we were protected. Nobody's thinking about it. You live in this country all your life and you never think about it, that the dikes will not be good. Even today, learning from disaster Hank Ovink's job is to travel the world preaching the gospel of water. He is, after all, the special envoy for water affairs for the Kingdom of the Netherlands. His mission is multifaceted. He talks to presidents and prime ministers, scientists and technocrats, children and academics about the importance of water, what a future with a changing climate might look like, and how to plan for and react to water-related disasters. Boiled to its essence, his advice is quite simple, use your disasters as teaching moments. A disaster, of course, is terrible because it's about real despair, with people dying and you lose a lot, Ovink said in an interview in Rotterdam. But it always still is an opportunity. When something like Harvey hit Houston, Irma, Sandy, Katrina, it doesn't really matter. It tells you where your system failed. The Dutch have been learning for centuries. Flooding in the Netherlands is a matter of national security. More than 50% of its land is either below sea level or at risk of floods from the North Sea and the major European rivers, the Rhine, the Meuse and the Scheldt, that fan out into deltas before discharging into the sea. Any major flood would not only be a human catastrophe for a nation of 17 million people but also an economic disaster. That, perhaps, is what sets the Dutch apart from many other parts of the world. In Texas, for instance, flooding is not an existential issue for all its 28 million people, though it is in Houston. So it's not surprising that the Netherlands spends about $3 billion on flood protection every year, funded by general national taxes, the Delta Fund and special taxes levied by local water boards responsible for the maintenance of the flood control infrastructure, such as dikes, pumps and canals. 
Those water boards, among the first democratically elected bodies in Europe, were created in the 13th century by communities that built dikes and reclaimed the land from the water. They still could not keep it entirely at bay, the street. Lucia Flood in 1287, the St. Elizabeth Flood in 1421, the St. Felix Flood, 1530, the Flood of 1916 all caused massive loss of life and destruction to property. Most of them were a result of vulnerability to North Sea storms. In the north of the country, a large body of water, called the Zuiderzee, protected marginally by a string of low-lying barrier islands, was especially prone to storm surges and high tides. So were the estuaries of the southwestern delta. After the 1916 storm, and in the face of some strong resistance to the idea, the government won approval to construct one of its most ambitious and audacious projects to date, a 20-mile dam, about 24 feet above sea level, that would cut off the Zuiderzee and be known as the Offsluthiek. When it officially opened in 1933, the project achieved three crucial objectives, it sharply reduced the threat to a large portion of the country from North Sea storm surges, it created, eventually, a huge freshwater lake called the Ice Elmir that was crucial for the nation's drinking water supply, and it allowed for the poldering, or reclamation, of large tracts of much-needed land to support a growing population. A building boom it was the 1953 flood, however, that brought out the Iron Fist. In essence, it showed the Dutch where their system had failed. The government appointed the Delta Commission, not so much to examine why the disaster occurred but to come up with a plan to make sure it would never happen again. This would be done by building a system of dams, storm surge barriers, canals, sluices, locks and other structures that would cost billions of dollars, take 44 years to complete and close off virtually all the estuaries in the southwest delta from the North Sea. In all, the Delta program resulted in 13 major infrastructure projects and required engineering expertise that was largely acquired on the fly as each project progressed. Two of them, the Hollandsche Eisel Storm Barrier and the Herring Vliet Sluices, were declared national monuments. The last of the Delta Works projects to be completed was the Mace Landgering, in 1997. It features a pair of gates on the waterway that connects the port of Rotterdam to the North Sea that can be closed if a storm surge threatens the city. The gates, each 688 feet long and supported by trusses that are 777 feet long, swivel on a ball joint and are controlled by a computer that constantly monitors weather, river discharge rates and sea level. If a storm surge is detected, the gates automatically close. Rhea Gellick, who was six during the 1953 flood that claimed the lives of 1836 people in the Netherlands, points out the names of her grandparents who were killed in the flood at a memorial at the Water Snood Museum in Auerkirk. Michael Chalo, Houston Chronicle, constructed at a cost of more than $500 million and $1,990, it has been closed in an emergency only once in 20 years. One project in the Delta Works program, a plan to close the Eastern Shelf Estuary with a dam, stands out because it became a turning point of sorts in how the Dutch policy of water management has evolved. Until the 1960s, little attention had been paid to the environmental impacts of flood control projects. But the plan to close the Eastern Scheldt sparked protests from fishermen and others. So instead of an impervious dam, engineers built a barrier that would remain open under normal conditions, allowing natural tidal movement in and out of the estuary, but that could be closed in the face of approaching North Sea storms. The Eastern Scheldt storm surge barrier was completed in 1986 and cost nearly $3 billion, more than all the other Delta Works projects combined. For the first time, protecting the environment factored into the Dutch mandate to protect its citizens and economic assets. In 1932, when the Offsluit Leak was built, it basically closed an estuary and turned it into a freshwater lake and allowed large-scale land reclamation, said Bai Yonkman, a professor of hydraulic engineering at Delft Technological University. I think today that would not have been possible. We're more in an era where as a profession we want to invent other solutions that are not only about steel and concrete but also nature-based and more ecologically friendly, a man casts his line into the North Sea near Diebenjard, the Netherlands as the eastern Scheldt storm surge barrier rises behind him. 5.5 mile long barrier was built as part of the Netherlands Delta Works project to protect inland areas from the sea. The Eastern Scheldt storm surge barrier has gates that are normally open to allow for tidal flow, but can be lowered in the event of a major storm. Michael Chalo, Houston Chronicle, room for the river just to the west of the small Dutch village of Workendam, the landscape unfolds in a somewhat atypical Dutch fashion, open, flecked with wetlands, seemingly untamed.
What is even more unusual is the sight of one of the major delta rivers, the Niu Merweed, flowing resolutely toward the North Sea, a view normally blocked by an enormous dike. What the Dutch government did here in what is known as Nordward would have been unthinkable 60 years ago, it actually lowered portions of the river dike, allowing it to overflow at high levels and spread out over the floodplain that was taken from it. The philosophy that has defined water management in the Netherlands for the last 30 years or so is markedly different from the brute force protection paradigm that ruled after the 1953 flood. This softer approach is reflected in the language that is now used when the Dutch talk about flood protection, spatial planning, resiliency, building with nature, room for the river, living with water. In 1993 and 1995, the threat of river flooding forced the mandatory evacuation of 250,000 residents. This, and the collective acceptance that global climate change will mean increased river flows and an ongoing threat in the future, prompted the government to embark on a program dubbed Room for the River, a 20-year project that would cost $2.73 billion. With Room for the River, I think the interesting thing is that after, say, 800 years of only strengthening and hiking dikes as the solution, we said maybe it's wiser to cooperate with nature, said Hans Brouwer, a senior rivers expert with the Room for the River program. The Netherlands forms the deltas for four major European rivers, the Rhine, the Moose, the Scheldt and the Ems, the biggest being the Rhine. The idea was to devise strategies that would give the river space to spread and discharge more quickly into the North Sea. These included excavating and deepening existing floodplains, moving dikes farther back from the river channels, creating high water channels and removing obstacles from the river's floodways. Most controversially, it included the pottering, lowering or moving dikes to allow the rivers to reclaim flood plains, which would require buying out and moving people off the land. When Annika van Malieveld was first approached by officials from the Room for the River program 20 years ago and told they were going to lower the dikes on the Nordward polder, her reaction was, what the hell, but she listened to the proposal and gradually came to see that by allowing the river room to escape when it needed to, she and her community had a chance to help save people in cities up and down river. Her husband was born on the polder, and she had lived there for 25 years. Their house was on an elevated section, so they weren't among those who had to adapt their dwellings to the floodplain or leave. But it took 20 years of negotiations that included her, her neighbors and the government before all the issues, who had to move, how much would homeowners and farmers be compensated, were resolved. In the end, about half of the 78 families living on the polder opted to leave. For Van Lilleveld, that was the hardest part. It changed this area, she said. It was a community. People are helping each other, know each other, exactly know when something strange is happening. Now that is totally gone. I still miss that. I miss the community that we had. Van Malieveld is still somewhat ambivalent. She wishes things were the way they had been, but she was heartened that the government sought input and listened. In the past, it had settled on projects and implemented them from the top down with little input. If you look in my heart, I don't like all the plans, she said. But if it's going to happen, you must make the best of it, and look forward and learn from the process because it was also a learning process for the government, a learning process for me and the citizens, and for the future. Other room for the river projects of note include another depottering project on the over Dieppe's polder, where dikes on the Berg's Moss River were lowered, allowing it to overflow onto what was once farmland. Eighteen farmers were told they had to leave or, with government assistance, rebuild their farmhouses and barns on raised mounds. Eight, including Noel Huimeisers and his wife, Will, decided to stay. Five years later, sitting at the kitchen table in their airy modern house with their milk cows in the barn nearby, they say they have no regrets. It took them a while to get used to the idea, but ultimately they were sold by the realization that letting the river take their land would help save many others from flooding. So far, the low-lying land has not flooded, and who I measures has been able to use it to grow feed for his cows. I hope that it will happen one day, and I will see it, he said of a potential flood. Not because I'm a masochist, but because then I will see that it is working. For the most part, the Dutch philosophy on water management has evolved over the centuries in response to events. The modern era, however, is being shaped by what might happen in the future. In 2009, the government adopted a national water plan that formalized the Room for the River program. It called for climate proofing the Netherlands against an anticipated rise in sea levels and higher river discharges linked to climate change. Based on available scientific data, the government envisions a rise in sea levels of between 6 and 13 inches by 2050 and between 13 inches and 33 inches by 2100. 
It expects the flow in the Rhine River to increase to 635,000 cubic feet per second. The Dutch plan on being ready for it. Tourists walk past the wine mills at Kinderdijk. The windmills, which are now a UNESCO World Heritage Site, were built around 1740 to pump water out of the area that sits below sea level. Tourists walk past the wine mills at Kinderdijk. The windmills, which are now a UNESCO World Heritage Site, were built around 1740 to pump water out of the area that sits below sea level. Photo, Michael Chalo, Houston Chronicle A man walks down the staircase of the V-Leader Monument overlooking the off Eek, a 20-mile dam constructed after a flood in 1916, as it stretches off into the horizon in Dan over the Netherlands. A man walks down the staircase of the V-Leader Monument overlooking the off Eek, a 20-mile dam constructed after a flood in 1916, as it stretches off into the horizon in Dan over the Netherlands. Photo, Michael Chalo, Houston Chronicle birds fly past ships sailing on the North Sea next to the off Eek, a 20-mile dam constructed after a flood in 1916, in Denover, the Netherlands. Birds fly past ships sailing on the North Sea next to the off Eek, a 20-mile dam constructed after a flood in 1916, in Denover, the Netherlands. Photo, Michael Chalo, Houston Chronicle homes sit on the other side of a dike holding back water from the Isel Mere, a lake that was created when the 20-mile off Peak was built, in Mackham, the Netherlands. Homes sit on the other side of a dike holding back water from the Isel Mere, a lake that was created when the 20-mile off Peak was built, in Mackham, the Netherlands. Photo, Michael Chalo, Houston Chronicle pedestrians walk down Damrak Avenue in Amsterdam. 21% of the population of the Netherlands lives below sea level. Pedestrians walk down Damrak Avenue in Amsterdam. 21% of the population of the Netherlands lives below sea level. Photo, Michael Chalo, Houston Chronicle A boat passes through a canal in front of Amsterdam Central in Amsterdam. A boat passes through a canal in front of Amsterdam Central in Amsterdam. Photo, Michael Chalo, Houston Chronicle The setting sun reflects off floating houses in the Iberg neighborhood of Amsterdam. Setting sun reflects off floating houses in the Iberg neighborhood of Amsterdam. Photo, Michael Chalo, Houston Chronicle The kitchen of a floating house looks out across the water at neighboring floating homes in the Iberg neighborhood of Amsterdam. The kitchen of a floating house looks out across the water at neighboring floating homes in the Iberg neighborhood of Amsterdam. Photo, Michael Chalo, Houston Chronicle Marker Wadden Restoration Project Leader Roel Posthorn walks along the shore of a newly created island being built in Markermeer Lake near Lel Eisted, the Netherlands. The chain of islands are being built to help clean the lake, act as an area for silt to collect, create a habitat for birds and provide a new recreation area for people. Les Marker Wadden Restoration Project Leader Roel Posthorn walks along the shore of a newly created island being built in Markermeer Lake near Lel Eisted, the Netherlands. The chain of islands are being built to. More photo, Michael Chalo, Houston Chronicle birds fly past a dredge that is creating the Marker Wadden, a set of islands being built in Markermeer Lake near Lel Eisted, the Netherlands. The islands are being built to help clean the lake, act as an area for silt to collect, create a habitat for birds and provide a new recreation area for people. Less birds fly past a dredge that is creating the Marker Wadden, a set of islands being built in Markermeer Lake near Lel Eisted, the Netherlands. The islands are being built to help clean the lake, act as an area for more photo, Michael Chalo, Houston Chronicle tire tracks crisscross the Marker Wadden, a set of islands being built in Markermeer Lake near Lel Eisted, the Netherlands. The islands are being built to help clean the lake, act as an area for silt to collect, create a habitat for birds and provide a new recreation area for people. Less tire tracks crisscross the Marker Wadden, a set of islands being built in Markermeer Lake near Lel Eisted, the Netherlands. The islands are being built to help clean the lake, act as an area for silt to collect. More photo, Michael Chalo, Houston Chronicle Marker Wadden Restoration Project Leader Roel Posthorn walks along the shore of a newly created island being built in Markermeer Lake near Lel Eisted, the Netherlands. The chain of islands are being built to help clean the lake, act as an area for silt to collect, create a habitat for birds and provide a new recreation area for people. Les Marker Wadden Restoration Project Leader Roel Posthorn walks along the shore of a newly created island being built in Markermeer Lake near Lel Eisted, the Netherlands. The chain of islands are being built to. More photo, Michael Chalo, Houston Chronicle A group of architects and designers walk along the Marker Wadden, a set of islands built in Markermeer Lake near Lel Eisted, the Netherlands. 
The islands are being built to help clean the lake, act as an area for silt to collect, create a habitat for birds and provide a new recreation area for people. Plus a group of architects and designers walk along the Marker Wadden, a set of islands built in Markermere Lake near Lelystad, the Netherlands. The islands are being built to help clean the lake, act as an area for more photo, Michael Chalo, Houston Chronicles loses along the marker ward peak regulate the water levels between between Markermere Lake and Iselmere, the biggest lake in the Netherlands, in Lelystad. Sluices along the marker ward peak regulate the water levels between between Markermere Lake and Iselmere, the biggest lake in the Netherlands, in Lelystad. Photo, Michael Chalo, Houston Chronicle A woman bikes along a path in Malievald Park in The Hague. A woman bikes along a path in Malievald Park in The Hague. Photo, Michael Chalo, Houston Chronicle The windmills at Kinderdijk turn along a canal. The windmills, which are now a UNESCO World Heritage Site, were built around 1740 to pump water out of the area that sits below sea level. The windmills at Kinderdijk turn along a canal. The windmills, which are now a UNESCO World Heritage Site, were built around 1740 to pump water out of the area that sits below sea level. Photo, Michael Chalo, Houston Chronicle A rainbow appears over one of the windmills at Kinderdijk. The windmills, which are now a UNESCO World Heritage Site, were built around 1740 to pump water out of the area that sits below sea level. A rainbow appears over one of the windmills at Kinderdijk. The windmills, which are now a UNESCO World Heritage Site, were built around 1740 to pump water out of the area that sits below sea level. Photo, Michael Chalo, Houston Chronicle A couple walks their dog next to the North Sea in West and Chowin, the Netherlands as the Eastern Scheldt Storm Surge Barrier rises behind them. The barrier was built as part of the Netherlands Delta Works project to protect inland areas from the sea. The Eastern Scheldt Storm Surge Barrier has gates that are normally open to allow for tidal flow, but can be lowered in the event of a major storm. Less a couple walks their dog next to the North Sea in West and Chowin, the Netherlands as the Eastern Scheldt Storm Surge Barrier rises behind them. The barrier was built as part of the Netherlands Delta Works. More photo, Michael Chalo, Houston Chronicle People play and walk along the beach next to the North Sea near Diebenjard, the Netherlands as the Eastern Scheldt Storm Surge Barrier rises behind them. The barrier was built as part of the Netherlands Delta Works project to protect inland areas from the sea. The Eastern Scheldt Storm Surge Barrier has gates that are normally open to allow for tidal flow, but can be lowered in the event of a major storm. Less people play and walk along the beach next to the North Sea near Diebenjard, the Netherlands as the Eastern Scheldt Storm Surge Barrier rises behind them. The barrier was built as part of the Netherlands Delta. More photo, Michael Chalo, Houston Chronicle Kite Borders Surf on a body of water in the middle of the sand motor, a beach replenishment project near Kiekduin, the Netherlands. The 2-kilometer-long, by 1-kilometer-wide area of dredged sand is designed to use prevailing winds and currents to constantly replenish the beaches. Less kite borders surf on a body of water in the middle of the sand motor, a beach replenishment project near Kiekduin, the Netherlands. The 2-kilometer-long, by 1-kilometer-wide area of dredged sand is. More photo, Michael Chalo, Houston Chronicle entrances to the cuss were Katwijk underground parking garage peek out from above a sand dune and dike in Katwijk on sea. The city combined protection from the North Sea with a functional use as they created a parking garage within the dune. Let entrances to the cuss were Katwijk underground parking garage peek out from above a sand dune and dike in Katwijk on sea. The city combined protection from the North Sea with a functional use as they created a more photo, Michael Chalo, Houston Chronicle names of the 1836 people killed in the 1953 flood in the Netherlands scroll across sand at a memorial in the Water Snood Museum in Our Kirk. Names of the 1836 people killed in the 1953 flood in the Netherlands scroll across sand at a memorial in the Water Snood Museum in Our Kirk. Photo, Michael Chalo, Houston Chronicle pictures of the 1953 flood, which claimed the lives of 1836 people in the Netherlands, sit on a table at the Water Snood Museum in Our Kirk. Pictures of the 1953 flood, which claimed the lives of 1836 people in the Netherlands, sit on a table at the Water Snood Museum in Our Kirk. Photo, Michael Chalo, Houston Chronicle Rhea Gellick, who was six years old during the 1953 flood that claimed the lives of 1836 people in the Netherlands, walks along the land where she and her family rode out the flood from the roof of their old home near Our Kirk. Less Rhea Gellick, who was six years old during the 1953 flood that claimed the lives of 1836 people in the Netherlands, walks along the land where she and her family rode out the flood from the roof of their old home. 
more photo, Michael Chalo, Houston Chronicle A cyclist rides along a path next to the Neumerweed Canal where dikes have been lowered next to farmland in the Nordward polder to allow rivers to flood if necessary in Workendam, the Netherlands. A cyclist rides along a path next to the Neumerweed Canal where dikes have been lowered next to farmland in the Nordward polder to allow rivers to flood if necessary in Workendam, the Netherlands. Photo, Michael Chalo, Houston Chronicle Noel Hu I. Meijers, a farmer in Overty Epps Polder, walks down to his farmland from the raised piece of land where his barn and home are built. The dikes in the area have been lowered to allow rivers to flood farmland if necessary to protect areas down in Waspik, the Netherlands. The farmers had to move their homes and barns onto raised pieces of land to be allowed to continue to live in the area. Les Noel Hu I. Meijers, a farmer in Overty Epps Polder, walks down to his farmland from the raised piece of land where his barn and home are built. The dikes in the area have been lowered to allow rivers to flood. More photo, Michael Chalo, Houston Chronicle A woman and dog walk across farmland in Overty Epps Polder where dikes have been lowered to allow rivers to flood farmland if necessary in Waspik, the Netherlands. The farmers had to move their homes and barns onto raised pieces of land to be allowed to continue to live in the area. Let's say woman and dog walk across farmland in Overty Epps Polder where dikes have been lowered to allow rivers to flood farmland if necessary in Waspik, the Netherlands. The farmers had to move their homes and barns. More photo, Michael Chalo, Houston Chronicle sheep graze in farmland in Overty Epps Polder where dikes have been lowered to allow rivers to flood farmland if necessary in Waspik, the Netherlands. The farmers had to move their homes and barns onto raised pieces of land to be allowed to continue to live in the area. Less sheep graze in farmland in over Dieppe's polder where dikes have been lowered to allow rivers to flood farmland if necessary in Waspik, the Netherlands. The farmers had to move their homes and barns onto raised. More photo, Michael Chalo, Houston Chronicle Fog settles over the floating pavilion and bobbing forest in the Rienhaven port in Rotterdam. Fog settles over the floating pavilion and bobbing forest in the Rienhaven port in Rotterdam. Photo, Michael Chalo, Houston Chronicle Public Water Management Information Center Press Officer Jeroen Kramer looks out at the Mace Landkering, a storm surge barrier that closes off the shipping channel with two 72-foot-tall and 695-foot-long barriers, in Rotterdam. The barrier, which is only closed in the event of an extreme storm, is one of the largest moving structures on Earth. Less Public Water Management Information Center Press Officer Jeroen Kramer looks out at the Mace Landkering, a storm surge barrier that closes off the shipping channel with two 72-foot-tall and 695-foot-long. More photo, Michael Chalo, Houston Chronicle A barge travels past the Mace Landkering, a storm surge barrier measuring 777 feet long that closes off the shipping channel with two 72-foot-tall and 695-foot-long barriers, in Rotterdam. The barrier, which is only closed in the event of an extreme storm, is one of the largest moving structures on Earth. Less a barge travels past the Mace Landkering, a storm surge barrier measuring 777 feet long that closes off the shipping channel with two 72-foot-tall and 695-foot-long barriers, in Rotterdam. The barrier, which is more photo, Michael Chalo, Houston Chronicle A ship travels up the new waterway next to the Mace Landkering, a storm surge barrier that closes off the shipping channel with two 72-foot-tall and 695-foot-long barriers, in Rotterdam. The barrier, which is only closed in the event of an extreme storm, is one of the largest moving structures on Earth. Less a ship travels up the new waterway next to the Mace Landkering, a storm surge barrier that closes off the shipping channel with two 72-foot-tall and 695-foot-long barriers, in Rotterdam. The barrier, which is, more photo, Michael Chalo, Houston Chronicle A canal cuts between buildings in Delft, the Netherlands. 26% of the Netherlands lies below sea level. A canal cuts between buildings in Delft, the Netherlands. 26% of the Netherlands lies below sea level. Photo, Michael Chalo, Houston Chronicle The Basilica of St. Nicholas sits behind a canal in Amsterdam. The Basilica of St. Nicholas sits behind a canal in Amsterdam. Photo, Michael Chalo, Houston Chronicle We would drown as well, as prepared, sophisticated, innovative and resourceful as they are, not even the Dutch could have withstood the Hurricane Harvey deluge which dumped up to 50 inches or more of rain over a wide swath of southeast Texas and added new shades of purple to the rainfall map. If we would get here what you have gotten in Houston, we would drown as well, said Jeroen Eertz, director of the Institute for Environmental Studies at the Virgie University at Amsterdam and an expert in the field of water and climate risk management. Let's be honest about it. We get about 30 inches of rain in a year.
You got much more than that in 48 hours or 3 days, but absent freak events such as Harvey, the Dutch have earned their position as a global reference for water management, as stated in a comprehensive report by the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development in 2014. And at least since 1953, they have been successful in keeping their feet dry. This is largely because for the Dutch, it's not a matter of if they should manage flood risks, it's purely a question of how. Protecting the nation from the threat of flooding is enshrined in the law of the land and not subject to changing political tides. The other key factor is that there is almost universal buy-in from the Dutch people. Dutch citizens are required to help pay for that protection. Hans Petersen, the coordinator for international affairs for the Rijkswaterstaat, estimated that the Dutch pay about $165 a year per household in taxes to their local water authority in addition to national taxes. We pay a lot of tax, said Marga Duijn, who lives in Nyberg, a suburb of Amsterdam built on reclaimed land east of the city and famous for its floating houses. But I don't care. Everybody knows that it is important. It's worth it. One thing the Dutch people can't pay for is flood insurance. It's not an option. The national government undertakes to protect its citizens and will make them whole if the systems fail and they are flooded. Only about 100,000 people out of a population of 17 million live outside of protected areas. The government believes that flood insurance would only encourage more to do so. Those who choose to live outside of protected areas are on their own. Boats sit in a canal next to Damrak Avenue in Amsterdam. Michael Chalo, Houston Chronicle, working with Texans the Dutch are reluctant to prescribe solutions to others' struggles with water. But the government recognizes that it has the experience and the moral obligation to help other countries. On the walls of Baa Yonkman's office at the Delft Technological University are maps and charts of the Houston, Galveston Bay Area. In a coffee cup on his desk, alongside the pens, is a small Texas flag. He is working with researchers at Texas A. Engineers from the Dutch Research Consortium Deltar has helped in the reconstruction of the flood protection system in New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina. Hank Govink, the Netherlands' special envoy for water affairs, travels the world on behalf of the Dutch government. We think that we have a responsibility as being a country with a lot of experience on water management, said Martin Beek, deputy program manager at the Dutch Ministry of Infrastructure and the Environment. Quote dot dot dot. We realize that the system that has been developed in the Netherlands cannot be copied one to one by another country. That would be ridiculous. I think there are specific principles which could apply for everybody. Some of those are obvious. Don't build in floodways, as Houston has allowed. Develop infrastructure to prevent a flood rather than relying on recovering from one. Plan for more extreme weather brought about by climate change. But other innovative steps that the Dutch are taking can be exported to other countries. The Dutch are recognized around the world for their work on flood prevention. Here are some observations from their experts. Act quickly after disasters. There is a narrow window of opportunity to take action after a major flood. Each event provides an X-ray of your flood protection system that will expose its vulnerabilities and weaknesses. The immediate aftermath of a disaster is the best time to develop a plan to address them, emphasize protection and prevent. I on the Dutch place the emphasis on protection and prevention, rather than recovery. Dutch citizens cannot buy flood insurance, which the government believes discourages people from building houses on floodplains outside of the protected areas. The government undertakes to keep its people safe and bears the cost of recovery if it fails. Central Flood Management System A centralized flood management system is the most efficient. For centuries, flood protection in the Netherlands was the responsibility of local water authorities, among the first democratically elected bodies in Europe. At one point, there were about 3,000 of them. Now there are about two dozen. Major flood protection measures are the purview of a national authority, the Rijkswaterstaat. Local water boards are responsible for maintaining the flood protection systems in their jurisdictions and for fresh water supply. Plan for climate change The Dutch accept that global climate change is real and will pose a threat to the nation in the form of a rise in sea level and in the discharge rates of the major rivers that flow through the country into the North Sea. The belief is at the heart of the country's flood management philosophy through the end of the century. Instead of fighting the water, they are now learning to live with it, invest in flood protection. A flood protection system is expensive at first, but the cost far outweighs what is spent on recovering from repeated events. In total, the Dutch spend about $3 billion per year on flood protection and maintenance on its system. For the most part, Dutch taxpayers foot the bill. On the south coast of the country, near the small resort town of Kiekduin, engineers have used sand dredged from offshore to create an artificial peninsula called the Sand Motor. 
It will use prevailing winds and currents to replenish the beaches that are constantly subject to erosion from the North Sea. In Rotterdam, they've built spaces that are designed to capture rainwater when necessary but that are used as urban parks when dry. Underground parking garages are designed to hold water in a flood. There is an aggressive, city-sponsored program to promote water-absorbing green roofs. Protective coastal dikes near Katwijk were covered with sand and vegetation. A parking garage was built underneath. Above all, Ovink said, don't let the opportunity to learn from adversity slip away. There is a narrow window, perhaps a year at most, in which to act before memory fades and life returns mostly to normal. Think about Harvey, he said. Assess it in all details and let it show Houston, governments on all scales, businesses and communities what you can do better. Open up the streets, the parks. Capture the water. Think about these rivers better. Look at your basins and the way you develop. Think about your whole infrastructure investment program. Then rethink and make it more resilient and never let your guard down. The 2014 report by the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development on Water Management Policies in the Netherlands found striking awareness gap among Dutch citizens related to key water management functions and a low perception of the risk of flooding, in part because no major flood has occurred since 1953. On a recent morning, Lisbeth Burkhout and Hans Hauer were looking at books filled with old black and white photographs of that disaster at the Water Snood Museum. Burkhout was a child when the flood occurred and wasn't a victim of it, but she remembers being afraid because suddenly we were aware of the danger of the water. By and large, they believe their government does an adequate job of protecting them from floods. But they also are aware that the climate is changing and what has been done for the present may not be sufficient for the future. We are living in a delta, said Hauer. There is always danger. The struggle against the water and the sea is an eternal struggle. This story was reported with support from the Solutions Journalism Network, a nonprofit that encourages reporting on responses to social problems. About our investigation, developing storm Hurricane Harvey was the most destructive storm in Houston's history. The late August storm dumped up to 60 inches of rain on southeast Texas, but the resulting damage was multiplied by actions taken, and not taken, during the past 50 years. Our seven-part series explains why the storm's damage was both a natural and man-made disaster. Tony Fremantle is a senior editor at The Chronicle. In his 35 years with the paper, he has worked as a general assignment reporter, a national correspondent, writing coach and, until recently, metro editor. A native of South Africa, Tony emigrated to the United States in 1980 and became a U.S. citizen in 2001. He was a finalist for the 1997 Pulitzer Prize in International Reporting for a series of stories from South Africa, Rwanda, El Salvador and Guatemala about why crimes against humanity go unstopped and unpunished. Contact him at tony.fremantle at crown.com. Follow him on Twitter at, at Tony Fremantle. Michael Chala moved to Texas from Colorado two years ago but has already acquired a pair of cowboy boots, a daily craving for tacos and an affinity for the word, yowl. He previously worked at the Colorado Springs Gazette, where he was the lead photographer on the Other Than Honorable series, which won the 2014 Pulitzer Prize for National Reporting. Follow him on Instagram and Twitter, or reach him by email at michael.chalo at cron.com. Interactives and audience engagement by Rachel Gleason designed by Jordan Rubio get engaged, where do we go from here? Seven Houston area leaders discussed flooding causes and solutions at a Greater Houston After Harvey Forum hosted by the Houston Chronicle in early December. Watch Wednesday night's keynote address by Jim Blackburn, co-director of Rice University's Severe Storm Prediction, Education and Evacuation from Disasters, SSPED, Center. Read his thoughts on living around water, sign up for our Facebook community to share your Harvey story, engage with other community members and ask our reporters questions, join the discussion on Twitter. Subscribe at the Houston Chronicle is dedicated to serving the public interest with fact-based journalism. That mission has never been more important. Show your support for our journalism at HoustonChronicle.com slash subscribe.